you appreciate players that have been great, have been really good, whatever it is. And, you know, what Adam Wainwright means to the Cardinals franchise, he's one of the best starting pitchers they've ever had. I don't know if there's any doubt about that. Um, just as someone who loves baseball, do you get sad, if that's the word, when you see one of the one of the great ones of his time, you see him just kind of run out of bullets? Did, I, I, I just you got a big heart under there, and I know you. So, what do you what do you make of Al, uh, Adam Wainwright's uh, demise, which was not unexpected, but I think it's a lot more severe than people people anticipated. Yeah, and nobody signs up for this. And uh, Bernie, I think this is unique to baseball. Not to say that players in other sports don't decline in a certain way, but because so much of baseball is individual action and focusing on one guy, a hitter or a pitcher, even in some cases a fielder, and you can see the decline in a way that you might be able to hide it on a football field, on a hockey rink, on a basketball court. There's no hiding when you're Adam Wainwright and you're going to the mound with a tiny fraction of the skills that you had as recently as two years ago. Uh, I'm ne- you know, when I was younger, I did the whole, oh, you know, just retire, you're embarrassing yourself. And I've come full, all the way around on that. I don't think you get to tell somebody when, what to do with their talent. I mean, I understand as fans, you don't necessarily, you're not enjoying watching this. But until a GM, an owner comes to you and says, hey, we got to take the uniform away from you, or you make that decision for yourself, these guys get to go out and play, and they've earned that. When a team decides, they no longer get to do that, I understand. But whether it's, you know, Mays in 73, Carlton, that was a comp I made yesterday, Carlton in 1988 bouncing around and getting his rear end kicked in like four different cities uh, before he decided to retire, or Adam Wainwright today, I think these guys have earned the right to make that decision for themselves. And Joe, listen, you're right. And and fans, and even a, a bloke like me, we, I'm not upset about it because the team is lost at sea. I mean, they're they're not going to mount any kind of comeback because they're so bad in so many phases of the game, and the rotation is just uh, just awful. It's not like Wainwright is blocking. Uh, a, a better starting pitcher. Well, maybe Steven Matz, but you, you ride with me on this. You know what I'm talking about. It's not like they have their number one pitching prospect and he's absolutely ready to go in the majors. He's not blocking anybody. And the team is 11 and a half games out. And they have a five and a half percent chance to win the division according to fan graphs. So this decision to, to just put him on the IL, let him regroup. If, if he does have some shoulder issues, then we they can deal with that accordingly. But there's no pressure to really take him out of the rotation because the, 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 team's, the team's gone and the season pretty much is gone. And so they don't lose anything by, by maybe bringing him back. I can't put a timetable on it. Uh, bringing him back at some point. They, there's just nothing that could get worse than it is right now. It's a weird situation, right? The Cardinals are in this position in part because Adam Wainwright suddenly lost. He just he fell off a cliff, and he's no longer a major league pitcher. But because of that sequence, because the Cardinals are 35 and 50, they could conceivably say, look, we'll spend the last six weeks of the season letting you get some ovation. You know, you run him out there once a week. You start him only at home games. You manipulate the rotation of the schedule. As you say, Bernie, if the games aren't going to matter, you can use a roster spot on Adam Wainwright pitching every 10 days or so and let him get the cheers and turn it into a bit of a farewell tour. But the Tigers, the Tigers haven't played meaningful baseball the last couple of years. This is what they've been able to do with Miguel Cabrera. You know, the games don't matter. We're just going to trot Mickey out there, let him get Mickey Miggy out there and let him get his, his cheers. Now, this is obviously not the season the Cardinals wanted to have, but if you're here, you may as well, you know, make the best of it. And you make the best one. You know, if the Cardinals had better pitching, this would also be a different conversation. If Matthew Libertor and, and uh, Gordon Graceffo and uh, you know, even Tink Hens, if those guys were blasting up through the minors and in, you know, demanding by their performance that they be three-fifths of the rotation, this would be a different conversation. But because there aren't many great options, you're now looking at playing out the string. And if you're going to play out the string, yes, let's honor one of the most popular players of this generation. Yeah, well said, and I, I think I, I think most people would agree with that, and and I don't know why they wouldn't. I, I know that as a fan who loves the game, I very much look forward, to, if nothing else, to seeing Adam Wait Adam Wainwright start game number 162 at Bush Stadium against the Reds, final game of the regular season, final game of his career. 
I don't care if he, he's only capable of, like, pitching to one batter. I, I just want to see him in that uniform, and I want to see I want to see the celebration and the love come pouring down on him because he, he's earned that. So that's my uh, – that's my vision, even if it comes to something like that. Like, that's the only time he could come back. But I, I suspect we'll see him sooner than that. Can I build something off you as somebody who sees yeah. him up close more than I do? The, even with all of the great things that he's done, I think the signature moment of Adam Wainwright's career is going to be throwing a curveball in relief and beating yep. Carlos Beltran and going to the 2006 World Series. Do you think so the combination of the Cardinals' bullpen woes Wainwright really being limited in terms of, for certainly a fastball at this point. Is there any thought, anything to the idea that you could go back and say, hey, look, let's put you back where it all started, turn you into a seventh inning, eighth inning reliever who throws 85% curveballs? So this is what guys do now. They go to the bullpen and they take their best pitch and they throw it all the time. You know, like Matt Whistler a couple of years ago threw 80% sliders for, for the Rays. Is there, you think there's any way he would be amenable to that and the team might sign off on that? Oh, I think I think he just wants to end his career, and if, if it all possible, end it on a positive note. You know, it's it, it's an int- the way you phrased it. Okay, like if you would have just told me, is there any chance they move him to the bullpen? I would have said no. Honestly, I would have said that. But the way you you set that up, it's it's interesting because yeah, if he goes out there and, and you know just throws if that if his shoulder is fine and he can snap that curveball and th- do it like he, even earlier this season he was doing it a little bit. Um, sure, then you could see where that would play. So that's an interesting idea, and I'm not just saying that because you're on and because you're my friend. I do think that's an interesting idea. Can't rule it out. Yeah, my, friends don't, my friends don't usually say that to me, so I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joe, let, let's talk about the National League. Um, because we won't talk to you before the All-Star break, which uh, I guess technically begins Sunday night or whatever. Um is there any question in your mind that Atlanta is the best team in the National League? And, and where are they vulnerable if they're vulnerable in any significant way? Uh, you know, they've got to get that rotation healthy. You know, Max Fried is supposed to come off the eye up pretty soon. I think there's some concern about Spencer Strider. If you, you look at Strider, obviously, you know, he's a very good start last time out. He's lost some velocity, and he has some struggles deep going deep in the game. If you look at his uh, first time around, second time around, third time around splits, they're pretty stark. So at some point, do they say, hey, look, this guy's only ever thrown, I think it was 135 innings last year. That was the max. Do we have to kind of sit him down for a bit? I think you'll see them. One of the things that they have the luxury of doing is planning for October. A lot of teams are going to go into the trade deadline having to plan for August and September. The Braves pretty much know they're going to. The, the only thing to question right now is home field advantage in the World Series. So they can go out and say, hey, look, who do we want to be our number three, number four starter in the playoffs? Who do we want? Do we want to try to upgrade on Marcelo Zuna or Eddie Rosario at the left field DH spot? They can make some targeted acquisition. Uh, but the, and, and the other thing you look at is the bullpen. I mean, when everybody's healthy, that's a really strong bullpen. But that's where you go out and say, hey, look, you know, can we add some depth to that pen, knowing that the, the playoffs now are a marathon and they're, they wear down bullpens so frequently. So do you want to add that third right-handed reliever? Do you want to add that lefty matchup guy who might not normally be in your bullpen in August and September, but because you only need to carry four starters in the playoffs, you have an extra bullpen spot. So I think they can make tactical moves while other teams are having to make strategic moves, and that's a big advantage for, that, uh, for the Braves' deadline. And uh, I want to ask you about the Dodgers in this context. The, the Dodgers have been an excellent team, as everybody knows, for quite a while. They're not quite as good. They have a lot of massive injury problems, uh, especially in their rotation. And Well, the bullpen, too, now. They're, they're just cobbling this thing together. Can, can they do enough cobbling in a, in a successful way that would make them, uh, you know, more formidable than they appear to be now? Like, what, what's the hope for the Dodgers? Well, I mean, the Dodgers went into recent postseason with also 105, 106 win season. And that didn't, you don't get to throw your record onto the field. And they ended right. up getting eliminated by the Braves in 21 and the Padres last year. So I think the, what the Dodgers have done is say, hey, look, we just want to be ready to go on October 4th or whatever it is. Now, you mentioned the, the injury. I mean, they're down four starters in the rotation. You can go back to the pre spring training. The injury to Gavin Lux. Remember, they let Trey Turner walk away in free agency. And they were going to play Gavin Lux, who's 24-year-old. He's been kind of getting better with time. He's going to be their everyday shortstop. And he was gone. 
So now you end up with Miguel Rojas and honestly, Mookie Betts played a great shortstop for them. It's pretty shocking. But they've been patching this thing even more than they thought they would. Remember, they're paying uh, Trevor Bauer $22 million for that pitch for them. Walker Bueller, you know, he's uh, coming back from Tommy John surgery. It's just this has been the year that kind of everything has gone wrong for them. And they're still, you know, the leading, leading the wild card race, probably going to end up winning that division, I think, and be the number two seed in the National League. So it gives you an idea of just how, a floor, how high a floor that they've set. But right now, if they play the Braves in a best of seven, the Braves are going to be a very big favorite. The Dodgers haven't been an underdog like this. Probably got to go back to like 17 to find them. the last time the Dodgers will have gone into a playoff series. As an underdog. If they get to the NLCS and it's those two teams, they're going to be a significant underdog. Uh, I want to talk to our friend Joe Sheehan about the Padres, too. They're 10 games out of first. I haven't looked at what their, their playoff odds are. But um, it, it seems like it would be a, a pretty big climb um, for them to – as I was looking at last year's record, I'm so sorry. It shows you, it shows you uh, how I am after a few days off. Um, they're sitting there at 40 and 46. They're six, six games out in the wild card side. What's their path? Uh, what's their hope? Are they good enough to, to make that proverbial run? Win the occasional one-run game. Uh, they're 5 and 15 in one-run games. And we've talked mm. about for years. There's, there's no skill involved in one-run games. On the, on the very margin, on the margin, a better bullpen, team with a better bullpen will do a little bit better. By and large, one-run games are just, you know, good fortune and luck and timing. Um, they're 0-7 in extra inning games. And I don't consider extra inning games legitimate. I don't think we should even count them in the stands. Uh, right. So, yeah, let's, let me start on the, the free runner one. Uh, but I will <laughs> say that the talent base is better than anybody else in this. You know, you think about the teams fighting for now, those fifth and sixth wild card spots. I would take the Padres' talent base over anybody else. So if there's a team in this group that can go, you know, 45 and 30, whatever it's going to take down the stretch, 48 and 28 or whatever, it's going to be the Padres. They've done it before. They've got, you talk about the top of that line, it was Machado and Soto and Tatis and Bogart. I mean, they're eventually going to have a stretch where they score you know, 38 runs in a week, and we're going to be worrying about them less. Um, the other thing about them this year, Bernie, remember the playoffs last year? Not even so much the regular season, but after they traded for Hader, he blew up and then he got it together. And then Luis Garcia, the rookie, the older rookie, excuse me, actually, the, he was with the Cardinals in uh, 2022, uh, 21. Right. And then uh, Stephen Wilson, the rookie. I mean, they, their bullpen in the postseason was utterly dominant. This year, it's one of the six worst, bull, six worst bullpens in baseball. That fall off, and you can point to the Cardinals. You can point to the Mets, even over the AL. You can point to the White Sox. These teams that had good bullpens last year, and their bullpens are just killing them this year. The Padres are on that list. So I do believe those things can turn around in the second half. I, I still think the Padres will end up stealing one of those in a wild card. Uh, Joe Sheehan with us. And by, we'll tell you how to get Joe Sheehan's newsletter, which is uh, invaluable. Uh, I, uh, I learn something every single time. He gets me to think. I think he would get all of us to think. So we'll tell you about how to get that, but you should give it a try. You really should. You can go to joshian.com for more info. I want to ask you about uh, the Cubs from this in, in, in this context. The Chicago media, including you know some writers that I think are pretty good actually. There's this constant debate whether the car, the the Cubs should be buyers or sellers, and it's still going on. And constant debate about well should they should they put Marcus Stroman out there uh, for for a potential trade and I, I don't I don't understand why there's even a debate I, I listen I, I like what the Cubs have done um, but they they're fading again and they're not ready to contend for a World Series championship I, I look anything can happen if you get in that's the, the John Mozalek uh, credo but is there any reason why the Cubs wouldn't be a seller in your mind We've got, so today's the 5th, three weeks will be the 26th. Most teams will play about 16 games in that time when you, you know, the all-star break in there. If you go 12-4, and four, for the Cubs, you go 12-4, and four, and now you're three and a half games out of the, the last wild card spot, and really basically the fifth wild card spot too, given the withstanding. I think it's very hard to, to, to sell from that position. This is the effect of the expanded playoffs, not just adding a team, but making it a best of three series. The numbers, if you were fighting for the four and five seeds in the last decade, you were talking about maybe playing a road game against Jacob deGrom. And it was really hard to invest a lot in that chance. But Bernie, we saw last year, the, the six seed and the five seed in the, in the NL both won their opening series. 
um, and they ended up playing against each other in the uh, in the NLCS. So if you can just get there, you're a threat. And I don't think you can say to your fans, who have been pretty beaten up by the Ricketts family in the last few years, yeah, we're three and a half games out of a playoff spot, but we're going to sell our number one starter. I think that's a really hard sell. And that's one of the things that's made the trade deadline really difficult with the expanded playoffs, where you have teams, I'll put the Red Sox in this group, I'll put the White Sox in this group. So recently I would have put the Cardinals in this group, but they keep losing. Where you have expectations of success, and you look at the standings and you go, well, you're not that far out of a playoff spot. But the team isn't that good. I think that's a hard line for teams to walk now, to say, hey, look, we're this close to a playoff spot. We just won 9 out of 12, but we're trading our number one starter. I think that's why this is a tough decision for the Cubs. I Remember, they, when they went out and spent a bunch of money this winter, too. They signed Bellinger. They signed Swanson. I mean, some of the lesser moves, Mancini, guys like that. But they basically told their fan base, this is the year we're going to start trying again. So to trade, to flip guys at the deadline, that's a hard sell. Those are all good points, Joe. Thank you. For, seriously, thank you for that. Um, I, I want to circle back. It's just a Cardinals-related question. Um, Jordan Montgomery is represented by Scott Boris. So we know that uh, highly unlikely he he'll, he'll, would re-sign with the Cardinals for some kind of discount. Um Jordan Montgomery, and maybe this is because everyone else is bad, but Jordan Montgomery has been a real standout for the Cardinals this year, and he was a standout for them when they got him from the Yankees uh, for the final two months last year. But I look at him today, he's like in the top 15 all-major league starters in war. I mean, you know, his peripherals are really good. It seems to me he'd be a he'd be a, guy, a a pitcher that some of the teams that, contending teams that really need a starting pitcher would pursue, even though he's in his walk year. I mean, what do you think his value is, especially with you know pending free agency uh, part of it? I think there's only so much a rental is ever going to get you anymore. I wrote about over the weekend a world of Chapman being sold as a rental for. You know, a, a former kind of failing first round pick in Cole Reagan and a baseball zygote in Ronnie Cabrera, who hasn't even played stateside yet. You just have to manage your expectations, even for a pitcher who's been as good as Montgomery, who, I think, in a playoff rotation, you'd agree with me, probably Slice Clawson is the number three, maybe yep. number two for some teams. He's not somebody you step in and say, okay, well, you're going to be, you know, Madison Bumgarner circa 2016. Um, I, I love the pitcher. I think he's going to make good money and will have earned it this free agency. I just, you've got to manage expectation with rentals. Um, you know, trading, I guess Gallegos has a year left. Uh, um, beyond this one, yeah, Tyler O'Neill, if he ever comes back from wherever he is, you know, he's got more than a year left. The, get, trading the player with the extra year matters possibly even more than the quality of player itself. Teams just aren't going to break the bank for rentals. Um, so I think you got to manage expectations as to what they could get for, for Montgomery. Yeah, and one of my theories, not that it's any great insight, because it's an obvious theory, if the Cardinals don't like what's offered for him, listen, they, they can they can issue a qualifying offer. I doubt that he would take it unless he gets hurt or something. And then I think they'd be happy to collect the first-round draft choice as compensation if, when another team signs him. I, I think that's a viable alternative. Do you agree? I have to look and see what the rules are now. I want to say I think the best you can do anymore is second round draft pick. Oh, I didn't know that. And there's there's a they, I, I, it's very complicated now because it has to do with who signs him, and are you a revenue sharing recipient or a revenue sharing payor, and where did they finish? And it? it's actually incredibly complicated now. And MLB just keeps wanting to make itself like the NFL, and nobody really wants that. <laughs> That's um, so, so true, man. But I, I'm I'm 90% sure, Bernie, that the highest you can do is get a second round pick. Um, and I think it might be like you get a second and a fifth that the guy's rated above us or the guy signs a certain side contract. So that's tough because if you're the Cardinals, you might be talking about letting him go for the 60th pick in the draft or something. Um, and that's a little harder to, to, to get excited about. Now, right. I think the 60th pick in the draft might be better than what's on offer for 10 starts of, of Jordan Montgomery. But it's not as easy as it used to be where you just say, oh, fine, give us the 30th pick in the draft. We'll happily take that. Um, it's, a, it's not as much value attached to um, to getting the, the draft pick. I will say this. I would offer Montgomery the qualifying offer and hope like heck he took one year and, you know, if I get Montgomery back for one year and $19 million, or negotiate off that to some kind of 3-57 and 57 deal, I would take Montgomery on, on any kind of contract like that. So c- keeping him, if it makes you a little bit more likely to retain him, is has to go into this equation. 
Good point. Yeah, another good point. Joe Sheehan with us. And Joe, uh, as always, it's been great, but I want to give the chance, uh, give you the chance again, tell, tell our listeners um, how they can start to receive the Joe Sheehan newsletter on uh, during the season. I mean, it's every day and you're bit, you stay very, very busy, load of content during the off season. And you, um, the, during the post season, it's a treasure trove of content. So you, you, you do it 12 months a year. You don't, you don't like wind down during the off season like a lot of people do, but so what's the best way that people should get your newsletter? Now, I wind down during the All-Star break. I'm actually taking next week off. <laughs> I appreciate That's great. the sell job, but I do, I do take the occasional week off. Um, no, no you're, not, you're not allowed. You're not allowed. Go uh, ahead. I'm where, sorry. It's where I write about baseball. Um, I write about baseball now for half my life. I was one of the guys that started Baseball Perspectives. I'm writing for SI, ESPN, everywhere, basically, over the years. And uh, now I do most of it in the newsletter. It's uh, one of the first email subscription newsletters out there. It is a subscription product. You have to pay for it. Get all that information at joshian.com. If you go to the site, you can actually see excerpts of recent newsletters. Scroll through, you actually see complete pieces I've done recently, get a sense of what it is I do. It's definitely got a stat head viewpoint that ties that I come out of that whole world with perspectives and such, but I like to think it's a good read as well. So, you know, I write about everything. I write about on field stuff, I write about stuff like the open days, I write about labor issues. Sometimes I get a wild hair and write about, you know, playing wiffle ball when I was 10 years old. That was one of those popular pieces I did last year. So, Please check it out, joshian.com. You get all the information there. There's an, e- there's an email link as well. If you have any questions, go ahead and, uh, and drop me an email. Joe, enjoy your, uh, your time off, and uh, we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. So joshian.com, everyone, please uh, subscribe. Uh, you won't be sorry that you did. Thanks, and until, yeah, until next time, be well, sir. Be well. Thank you. That's our friend Joe Sheehan. You know, and, and people might think I'm just saying this because he's on the air. No, he's on the air because this guy – had a major influence in getting me to understand, you know, the, the things that really are valuable about assessing performance, you know, and sort of knocking down some of the old, uh, some of these old, outdated, old school concepts that are not irrelevant, but they're just not as important as people stuck in the past think they are, you know. And um, Joe Sheen had a tremendous influence on me. So when I say I learn something every time I read him, let me, let, me, let me back that up by saying this. I just learned about two or three things in a 20-minute conversation, including the draft choice compensation. And he's right because they've, they are trying to be the NFL. Why? I don't know. But it is so complicated. It's all, or even in the NBA with these trades that just yes. you're like wait can i does anyone get anybody got some aspirin out there i just my head hurts you can't even understand what's being traded because it's so convoluted so no he's right about that and he's also right about um if you have any chance at all to re-sign him with scott boris i doubt it unless there's an injury concern or something but you probably stand a better chance if you keep him and he stays here now He's told, I'm talking about Montgomery, he's told John Denton that he really wants to stay here. He even said that in spring training. Because as John Denton told us, which I thought was really interesting information, his wife had just established a dermatology uh, dermatology practice. She's a doctor mm-hmm. uh, in New York. Had just set it up at the time he was traded. So He's in St. Louis, knew he'd be here just, just, we think, you know, all of this year. Maybe maybe he'll get traded. We'll wait and see. So she moved her practice to St. Louis and set up here, and they're very happy here. Now, we've kind of heard these stories, oh, I don't know, five million times. <laughs> uh, and with Scott Boris as your agent and his ability to sweet talk and romance and manipulate all of these teams that are interested in one of his clients. And when I say those things, it's not a criticism. I admire him. He, he can sell anything to any gullible front office or any dense front office. <laughs> and he's one of the greatest. Uh, I think he's the greatest agent in the history of sports. That's my opinion. So it's easy to say, you know, well, you know, his wife just relocated her practice here. And, and Montgomery really likes it here. Both of those things can be true, but the comeback to that is always two words, Scott Boris. You know what I'm saying? I know exactly. I can give you a scenario in my head as you're describing I go, Scott Boris on the phone with him. Um, I know you just got things settled in here, but 
San Diego really needs pitching this year, and I can get us a really good deal, and I can set you up in your dermatology practice somewhere in San Diego. Would you like that? Yeah. Live by the beach, you two kids. Uh-huh. Yeah. A.J. Prowler just loves to spend money. He yeah. and I will get this done in no time. Um, in a related note, well, I tell you what, we'll take a break and come back okay. and talk about this because I, I think that I'm not sure what, what John Mosaic's got in mind. It, it's not going to be uh, trading Paul Goldschmidt. Uh, the Athletic, which is losing credibility by the day, one of their baseball writers got the townsfolk all excited again because he was making his predictions at the trade deadline as part of the power rankings. And his prediction was that Goldie would be traded. He didn't say to who. Even though Katie Wu, who covers the team, has, has even said it's not going to happen. <laughs> but... Anything for uh, get the old clicking going, right? Yeah. They're, they're laying off people, and everyone's just a li- maybe just a little on edge and say, okay, okay, prediction. Cardinals will trade Jordan Hicks. Is that going to get anyone buzzing on bulletin oh, boards? We need a bigger name than yeah. that. Come I, I, on. It's just I can't <laughs> stand this stuff. Anyway, uh, we'll talk about the Cardinals and the trade deadline coming up. They're definitely sellers. I think they've been sellers for quite a while, but – Again, when people hear seller, they they assume that it's kind of like a clearance sale. Everything must go. It's not that. So adjust your expectations accordingly. That's all I would recommend. I could be wrong, but I know Goldie and Aronado aren't going anywhere. I, I will say that with supreme confidence. You can laugh at me if it ha- something happens. That it, it isn't. It isn't, as, as I say. But... Uh, the, you know the only way I see Goldie being traded? I mean this. I really mean this. He Out of the blue, 100% unexpected and 100% out of character, he goes to John Mozalek and says, look, if you want to trade me, I, I, it depends on the team, but I'll agree to it if it's the right team. That's, that's the, that is the only way that he'll be traded. Because he, by the way, he has the final say. But even though he has the final say and can veto any trade, they're not going to trade him unless, the, unless he wants to be traded and he conveys that to the front office. I don't think he will. I think that's a real long shot. I think that's a real re- leap of, of confidence to think that that's even remotely possible. But if you're asking me, okay, we know how you feel about this, but what would it take for them to trade Goldie? It would take Goldie going into John Mazelak and saying, look, we have to talk. Here are a few teams that I'd be interested in playing with. And it's got to be a team that's going to have a chance to win a World Series in the next couple, three years, right? That's accurate. I don't think he'll do it. But I'm just if someone is, like, demanding that I say, okay, what scenario would result in a trade? That's the scenario, which is, and I'm sorry, because it's not one of these total fantasy fiction knucklehead trade, trade uh, uh, hallucinogenic uh, trade you know, trade, trade. Uh, what's the word? Uh, Fantasy world. Trade, trade potential. It's not one of these things that you would have to be on. I think actually be on hallucinogenics to to actually believe it'll happen. But if he wants to make it happen, okay. Whole different, whole different situation. I don't think it, I don't think that's going to occur though. We'll that, see. It's up yeah. to Goldie. That's uh, that's out of character for him. But you never know. He look. Somebody could walk in there one to go. Just I had enough of this. I, I you got to get to move me. Not saying that's him, but that would be along yeah. the lines of that scenario you're talking about. I tell you another thing about Goldie and uh, Arenado. Now Arenado, I think, has got. He's the type of guy that will real would would actually voice his complaints. Goldie would too, but it would be in a different way. I think both of those guys need to have a little. Uh, if they're not going to be traded, which they're not. They need to have a little conversation with uh, – they need to go in there together, have a conversation with Mosaic, and, and, and actually DeWitt should be part of it. And it would start off with, like, can we, ha- can we ask you a question? Oh, sure, anything. Why did you trade for us if you're not really going to go all out to win a World Series? What, what – what, Arenado would say – I could have I gone out as a free agent after last season and just made – another just incredible sum of money and probably would have ended up with a team that does have a legitimate shot to win the World Series. So what, 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 are, you, what are we doing here? What are we doing here? 
the team's getting worse. There's, there's, no, there's no heroes down on the farm that are ready to save the day. I'm sorry, Mason. I can't put Mason win in that category, right? No. Tink Hentz just got promoted to double A, and I think that's great, and he pits very well in his debut there. He's not ready to go at the major league. So what, if, if I'm both of those guys, it's like, what, what exactly are we doing here? I mean, I, what was the point of getting us? And, you know, t- just to win a bad division and then go out in the playoffs, and you know, each time very quickly. Now, the, of course, the, the cynics would say, well, they're part of that reason. True. Point well taken. Yeah. But that's not really the point. The point is if you, if you make the trade for those guys, and e- granted the trades were one-sided and laughable in terms of being in the Cardinals' favor, w- w- how many more years are you going to waste? How many more years are you going to throw away? If I was those two, I'd want some damn answers. You're 100% on that one because Arenado was like, hey, we're barely above the guys I just left right now. <laughs> I mean, do you look at the standings? Colorado's as bad as we are, yeah. which is embarrassing. The Goldie, Goldie Goldie's th- old team is doing, you know, yeah, Goldie's really like, well. Oh, hold on a minute here. Those guys rebuilt in a couple of years that I've been gone, and we're where we're at right now. Where are we? What, what's, what's going the, on? What's here? the plan? Yes, I, uh, d- Mr. Dewitt, do you re- do you understand, sir, that it's not 1996 anymore? What are we going to do about our pitching? Stuff? You have to pay for pitching, because right now you have one guy signed for next year. I well, Matt's too. Michael is Matt's. Oh uh, yeah, you're right. I forgot about Matt's already. <laughs> 